The Idol House of Astarte. And now, Dr. Pender, what are you going to tell us? The old clergyman smiled gently. My life has been passed in quiet places, he said. Very few eventful happenings have come my way. Yet once, when I was a young man, I had one very strange and tragic experience. Ah, said Joyce Lompriere encouragingly. I have never forgotten it, continued the clergyman. It made a profound impression on me at the time, and to this day, by a slight effort of memory, I can feel again the awe and horror of that terrible moment when I saw a man stricken to death by apparently no mortal agency. You make me feel quite creepy, Pender, complained Sir Henry. It made me feel creepy, as you call it, replied the other. Since then, I have never laughed at the people who use the word atmosphere. There is such a thing. There are certain places imbued and saturated with good or evil influences which can make their power felt. That house, the Larches, is a very unhappy one, remarked Miss Marple. Old Mr. Smithers lost all his money and had to leave it. Then the Carslakes took it, and Johnny Carslake fell downstairs and broke his leg. And Mrs. Carslake had to go away to the south of France for her health. And now the Burdens have got it, and I hear that poor Mr. Burden has got to have an operation almost immediately. There is, I think, rather too much superstition about such matters, said Mr. Petherick. A lot of damage is done to property by foolish reports, heedlessly circulated. I have known one or two ghosts that have had a very robust personality, remarked Sir Henry with a chuckle. I think, said Raymond, we should allow Dr. Pender to go on with his story. Joyce got up and switched off the two lamps, leaving the room lit only by the flickering firelight. Atmosphere, she said. Now we can get along. Dr. Pender smiled at her, and leaning back in his chair and taking off his pince-nez, he began his story in a gentle, reminiscent voice. I don't know whether any of you know Dartmoor at all. The place I am telling you about is situated on the borders of Dartmoor. It was a very charming property, though it had been on the market without finding a purchaser for several years. The situation was perhaps a little bleak in winter, but the views were magnificent, and there were certain curious and original features about the property itself. It was bought by a man called Hayden, Sir Richard Hayden. I had known him in his college days, and though I had lost sight of him for some years, the old ties of friendship still held, and I accepted with pleasure his invitation to go down to Silent Grove, as his new purchase was called. The house party was not a very large one. There was Richard Hayden himself, and his cousin Elliot Hayden. There was a Lady Mannering, with a pale, rather inconspicuous daughter called Violet. There was a Captain Rogers and his wife, hard-riding, weather-beaten people who lived only for horses and hunting. There was also a young Dr. Simons, and there was Miss Diana Ashley. I knew something about the last named. Her picture was very often in the society papers, and she was one of the notorious beauties of the season. Her appearance was indeed very striking. She was dark and tall, with a beautiful skin of an even tint of pale cream, and her half-closed dark eyes gave her a curiously piquant Asian appearance. She had, too, a wonderful speaking voice, deep-toned and bell-like. I saw at once that my friend Richard Hayden was very much attracted by her, and I guessed that the whole party was merely arranged as a setting for her. 
Of her own feelings, I was not so sure. She was capricious in her favors, one day talking to Richard and excluding everyone else from her notice, and another day she would favor his cousin, Elliot, and appear hardly to notice that such a person as Richard existed. And then again, she would bestow the most bewitching smiles upon the quiet and retiring Dr. Simons. On the morning after my arrival, our host showed us all over the place. The house itself was unremarkable, a good solid house built of Devonshire granite, built to withstand time and exposure. It was unromantic, but very comfortable. From the windows of it, one looked out over the panorama of the moor, vast rolling hills crowned with weather-beaten tors. On the slopes of the tor nearest to us were various hut circles, relics of the bygone days of the late Stone Age. On another hill was a barrow which had recently been excavated and in which certain bronze implements had been found. Hayden was by way of being interested in antiquarian matters, and he talked to us with a great deal of energy and enthusiasm. This particular spot, he explained, was particularly rich in relics of the past. Neolithic hut dwellers, Druids, Romans, and even traces of the early Phoenicians were to be found. But this place is the most interesting of all, he said. You know its name, Silent Grove. Well, it is easy enough to see what it takes its name from. He pointed with his hand. That particular part of the country was bare enough, rocks, heather, and bracken, but about a hundred yards from the house, there was a densely planted grove of trees. That is a relic of very early days, said Hayden. The trees have died and been replanted, but on the whole, it has been kept very much as it used to be, perhaps in the time of the Phoenician settlers. Come and look at it. We all followed him. As we entered the grove of trees, a curious oppression came over me. I think it was the silence. No birds seemed to nest in these trees. There was a feeling about it of, desolation and horror. I saw Hayden looking at me with a curious smile. Any feeling about this place, Pender? He asked me. Antagonism now, or uneasiness? I don't like it, I said quietly. You are within your rights. This was a stronghold of one of the ancient enemies of your faith. This is the grove of Astarte. Astarte? Astarte, or Ishtar, or Ashtoreth, or whatever you choose to call her. I prefer the Phoenician name of Astarte. There is, I believe, one known grove of Astarte in this country, in the north, on the wall. I have no evidence, but I like to believe that we have a true and authentic grove of Astarte. Here, here, within this dense circle of trees, sacred rites were performed. Sacred rites, murmured Diana Ashley. Her eyes had a dreamy, faraway look. What were they, I wonder? Not very reputable by all accounts, said Captain Rogers with a loud, unmeaning laugh. Rather hot stuff, I imagine. Hayden paid no attention to him. In the center of the grove, there should be a temple, he said. I can't run to temples, but I have indulged in a little fancy of my own. We had, at that moment, stepped out into a little clearing in the center of the trees. In the middle of it was something not unlike a summer house made of stone. Diana Ashley looked inquiringly at Hayden. I call it the idol house, he said. It is the idol house of Astarte. He led the way up to it. Inside, on a rude ebony pillar, 
there opposed a curious little image representing a woman with crescent horns seated on a lion. Astarte of the Phoenicians, said Hayden, the goddess of the moon. The goddess of the moon, cried Diana. Oh, do let us have a wild orgy tonight, fancy dress, and we will come out here in the moonlight and celebrate the rites of Astarte. I made a sudden movement, and Elliot Hayden, Richard's cousin, turned quickly to me. You don't like all this, do you, Padre? He said. No, I said gravely. I don't. He looked at me curiously. But it is only tomfoolery. Dick can't know that this really is a sacred grove. It is just a fancy of his. He likes to play with the idea. And anyway, if it were. If it were? Well, he laughed uncomfortably. You don't believe in that sort of thing, do you? You, a parson? I am not sure that, as a parson, I ought not to believe in it. But that sort of thing is all finished and done with. I am not so sure, I said musingly. I only know this. I am not, as a rule, a sensitive man to atmosphere. But ever since I entered this grove of trees, I have felt a curious impression and sense of evil and menace all round me. He glanced uneasily over his shoulder. Yes, he said. It is. It is queer somehow. I know what you mean, but I suppose it is only our imagination makes us feel like that. What do you say, Simons? The doctor was silent a moment or two before he replied. Then he said quietly, I don't like it. I can't tell you why, but somehow or other, I don't like it. At that moment, Violet Mannering came across to me. I hate this place, she cried. I hate it. Do let's get out of it. We moved away, and the others followed us. Only Diana Ashley lingered. I turned my head over my shoulder and saw her standing in front of the idol house, gazing earnestly at the image within it. The day was an unusually hot and beautiful one, and Diana Ashley's suggestion of a fancy dress party that evening was received with general favor. The usual laughing and whispering and frenzied secret sewing took place, and when we all made our appearance for dinner, there were the usual outcries of merriment. Rogers and his wife were Neolithic hut dwellers, explaining the sudden lack of hearth rugs. Richard Hayden called himself a Phoenician sailor, and his cousin was a brigand chief. Dr. Simons was a chef, Lady Mannering was a hospital nurse, and her daughter was a Circassian slave. I myself was arrayed somewhat too warmly as a monk. Diana Ashley came down last and was somewhat of a disappointment to all of us, being wrapped in a shapeless black domino. The unknown, she declared airily. That is what I am. Now, for goodness sake, let's go in to dinner. After dinner, we went outside. It was a lovely night warm and soft, and the moon was rising. We wandered about and chatted, and the time passed quickly enough. It must have been an hour later when we realized that Diana Ashley was not with us. Surely she's not gone to bed, said Richard Hayden. Violet Mannering shook her head. Oh, no, she said. I saw her going off in that direction about a quarter of an hour ago. She pointed as she spoke towards the grove of trees that showed black and shadowy in the moonlight. I wonder what she's up to, said Richard Hayden. Some devilment, I swear. Let's go and see. We all trooped off together, somewhat curious as to what Miss Ashley had been up to. Yet I, for one, felt a curious reluctance to enter that dark, foreboding belt of trees. 
Something stronger than myself seemed to be holding me back and urging me not to enter. I felt more definitely convinced than ever of the essential evilness of the spot. I think that some of the others experienced the same sensations that I did, though they would have been loath to admit it. The trees were so closely planted that the moonlight could not penetrate. There were a dozen soft sounds all round us, whisperings and sighings. The feeling was eerie in the extreme, and by common consent, we all kept close together. Suddenly, we came out into the open clearing in the middle of the grove and stood rooted to the spot in amazement. For there, on the threshold of the idle house, stood a shimmering figure wrapped tightly round in diaphanous gauze and with two crescent horns rising from the dark masses of her hair. My God, said Richard Hayden, and the sweat sprang out on his brow. But Violet Mannering was sharper. Why, it's Diana, she exclaimed. What has she done to herself? Oh, she looks quite different somehow. The figure in the doorway raised her hands. She took a step forward and chanted in a high, sweet voice. I am the priestess of Astarte, she crooned. Beware how you approach me, for I hold death in my hand. Don't do it, dear, protested Lady Mannering. You give us the creeps, you really do. Hayden sprang forward towards her. My God, Diana, he cried, you are wonderful. My eyes were accustomed to the moonlight now, and I could see more plainly. She did, indeed, as Violet had said, look quite different. Her face was more definitely Asian, and her eyes had something cruel in their gleam. And the strange smile on her lips was one that I had never seen there before. Beware, she cried warningly. Do not approach the goddess. If anyone lays a hand on me, it is death. You are wonderful, Diana, cried Hayden, but do stop it. Somehow or other, I, I don't like it. He was moving towards her across the grass, and she flung out a hand towards him. Stop, she cried. One step nearer, and I will smite you with the magic of Astarte. Richard Hayden laughed and quickened his pace, when all at once, a curious thing happened. He hesitated for a moment, then seemed to stumble and fall headlong. He did not get up again, but lay where he had fallen, prone on the ground. Suddenly, Diana began to laugh hysterically. It was a strange, horrible sound breaking the silence of the glade. With an oath, Elliot sprang forward. I can't stand this, he cried. Get up, Dick, get up, man. But still, Richard Hayden lay where he had fallen. Elliot Hayden reached his side, knelt by him, and turned him gently over. He bent over him, peering in his face. Then he rose sharply to his feet and stood swaying a little. Doctor, he said, doctor. For God's sake, come, I, I think he's dead. Simons ran forward and Elliot rejoined us, walking very slowly. He was looking down at his hands in a way I didn't understand. At that moment, there was a wild scream from Diana. I've killed him, she cried. Oh my God, I didn't mean to, but I've killed him. And she fainted dead away falling in a crumpled heap on the grass. There was a cry from Mrs. Rogers. Oh, do let us get away from this dreadful place, she wailed. Anything might happen to us here. Oh, it's awful. Elliot got hold of me by the shoulder. It can't be, man, he murmured. I tell you, it can't be. 
A man cannot be killed like that. It is, it's against nature. I tried to soothe him. There is some explanation, I said. Your cousin must have had some unsuspected weakness of the heart. The shock and excitement. He interrupted me. You don't understand, he said. He held up his hands for me to see, and I noticed a red stain on them. Dick didn't die of shock, he was stabbed. Stabbed to the heart, and there is no weapon. I stared at him incredulously. At that moment, Simons rose from his examination of the body and came towards us. He was pale and shaking all over. Are we all mad? He said. What is this place that things like this can happen in it? Then it is true, I said. He nodded. The wound is such as would be made by a long, thin dagger, but there is no dagger there. We all looked at each other. But it must be there, cried Elliot Hayden. It must have dropped out. It must be on the ground somewhere. Let us look. We peered about vainly on the ground. Violet Mannering said suddenly, Diana had something in her hand, a kind of dagger. I saw it, I saw it glitter when she threatened him. Elliot Hayden shook his head. He never even got within three yards of her, he objected. Lady Mannering was bending over the prostrate girl on the ground. There is nothing in her hand now, she announced, and I can't see anything on the ground. Are you sure you saw it, Violet? I didn't. Dr. Simons came over to the girl. We must get her to the house, he said. Rogers, will you help? Between us, we carried the unconscious girl back to the house. Then we returned and fetched the body of Sir Richard. Dr. Pender broke off apologetically and looked round. One would know better nowadays, he said, owing to the prevalence of detective fiction. Every street boy knows that a body must be left where it is found. But in these days, we had not the same knowledge. And accordingly, we carried the body of Richard Hayden back to his bedroom in the square granite house. And the butler was dispatched on a bicycle in search of the police, a ride of some 12 miles. It was then that Elliot Hayden drew me aside. Look here, he said. I'm going back to the grove. That weapon has got to be found. If there was a weapon, I said doubtfully. He seized my arm and shook it fiercely. You have got that superstitious stuff into your head. You think his death was supernatural. Well, I am going back to the grove to find out. I was curiously averse to his doing so. I did my utmost to dissuade him, but without result. The mere idea of that thick circle of trees was abhorrent to me, and I felt a strong premonition of further disaster. But Elliot was entirely pig-headed. He was, I think, scared himself, but would not admit it. He went off fully armed with determination to get to the bottom of the mystery. It was a very dreadful night. None of us could sleep or attempt to do so. The police, when they arrived, were frankly incredulous of the whole thing. They evinced a strong desire to cross-examine Miss Ashley, but there they had to reckon with Dr. Simons, who opposed the idea vehemently. Miss Ashley had come out of her faint or trance, and he had given her a long sleeping draught. She was on no account to be disturbed until the following day. It was not until about seven o'clock in the morning that anyone thought about Elliot Hayden. And then Simons suddenly asked where he was. I explained what Elliot had done, and Simons' grave face grew a shade graver. 
I wish he hadn't. It is, it is foolhardy, he said. You don't think any harm can have happened to him? I hope not. I think, Padre, that you and I had better go and see. I knew he was right, but it took all the courage in my command to nerve myself for the task. We set out together and entered once more that ill-fated grove of trees. We called him twice and got no reply. In a minute or two, we came into the clearing which looked pale and ghostly in the early morning light. Simons clutched my arm, and I uttered a muttered exclamation. Last night, when we had seen it in the moonlight, there had been the body of a man lying face downwards on the grass. Now, in the early morning light, the same sight met our eyes. Elliot Hayden was lying on the exact spot where his cousin had been. My God, said Simons, it has got him, too. We ran together over the grass. Elliot Hayden was unconscious, but breathing feebly, and this time there was no doubt of what had caused the tragedy. A long, thin bronze weapon remained in the wound. Got him through the shoulder, not through the heart. That is lucky, commented the doctor. On my soul, I don't know what to think. At any rate, he is not dead, and he will be able to tell us what happened. But that was just what Elliot Hayden was not able to do. His description was vague in the extreme. He had hunted about vainly for the dagger, and at last, giving up the search, had taken up a stand near the idol house. It was then that he became increasingly certain that someone was watching him from the belt of trees. He fought against this impression, but was not able to shake it off. He described a cold, strange wind that began to blow. It seemed to come not from the trees, but from the interior of the idol house. He turned round, peering inside it. He saw the small figure of the goddess, and he felt he was under an optical delusion. The figure seemed to grow larger and larger, then he suddenly received something that felt like a blow between his temples, which sent him reeling back, and as he fell, he was conscious of a sharp, burning pain in his left shoulder. The dagger was identified this time as being the identical one which had been dug up in the barrow on the hill, and which had been bought by Richard Hayden. Where he had kept it, in the house or in the idle house in the grove, no one seemed to know. The police were of the opinion, and always will be, that he was deliberately stabbed by Miss Ashley. But in view of our combined evidence that she was never within three yards of him, they could not hope to support the charge against her. So, the thing has been, and remains, a mystery. There was a silence. There doesn't seem anything to say, said Joyce Lampriere at length. It is all so horrible and uncanny. Have you no explanation for yourself, Dr. Pender? The old man nodded. Yes, he said. I have an explanation. A kind of explanation, that is, rather a curious one, but... To my mind, it still leaves certain factors unaccounted for. I have been to seances, said Joyce, and you may say what you like, very queer things can happen. I suppose one can explain it by some kind of hypnotism. The girl really turned herself into a priestess of Astarte, and I suppose somehow or other she must have stabbed him. Perhaps she threw the dagger that Miss Mannering saw in her hand. Or it might have been a javelin, suggested Raymond West. After all, moonlight is not very strong. She might have had a kind of spear in her hand and stabbed him at a distance. And then, I suppose, mass hypnotism comes into account. I mean, 
you were all prepared to see him stricken down by supernatural means. And so you saw it like that. I have seen many wonderful things done with weapons and knives at music halls, said Sir Henry. I suppose it is possible that a man could have been concealed in the belt of trees and that he might from there have thrown a knife or a dagger with sufficient accuracy, agreeing, of course, that he was a professional. I admit that seems rather far-fetched, but it seems the only really feasible theory. You remember that the other man was distinctly under the impression that there was someone in the grove of trees watching him. As to Miss Mannering saying that Miss Ashley had a dagger in her hand, and the others saying she hadn't, that doesn't surprise me. If you had had my experience, you would know that five persons' account of the same thing will differ so widely as to be almost incredible. Mr. Petherick coughed. But in all these theories, we seem to be overlooking one essential fact, he remarked. What became of the weapon? Miss Ashley could hardly get rid of a javelin, standing as she was in the middle of an open space. And if a hidden murderer had thrown a dagger, then the dagger would still have been in the wound when the man was turned over. We must, I think, discard all far-fetched theories and confine ourselves to sober fact. And where does sober fact lead us? Well, one thing seems quite clear. No one was near the man when he was stricken down. So the only person who could have stabbed him was he himself. Suicide, in fact. But why on earth should he wish to commit suicide? Asked Raymond West incredulously. The lawyer coughed again. Ah, that is a question of theory once more, he said. At the moment, I am not concerned with theories. It seems to me, excluding the supernatural, in which I do not for one moment believe, that that was the only way things could have happened. He stabbed himself, and as he fell, his arms flew out, wrenching the dagger from the wound and flinging it far into the zone of the trees. That is, I think, although somewhat unlikely, a possible happening. I don't like to say, I'm sure, said Miss Marple. It all perplexes me very much indeed. But curious things do happen. At Lady Sharpley's garden party last year, the man who was arranging the clock golf tripped over one of the numbers. Quite unconscious he was, and didn't come round for about five minutes. Yes, dear aunt, said Raymond gently. But he wasn't stabbed, was he? Of course not, dear, said Miss Marple. That is what I'm telling you. Of course there is only one way that poor Sir Richard could have been stabbed, but I do wish I knew what caused him to stumble in the first place. Of course, it might have been a tree root. He would be looking at the girl, of course, and when it is moonlight, one does trip over things. You say that there is only one way? That Sir Richard could have been stabbed, Miss Marple, said the clergyman, looking at her curiously. It is very sad, and I don't like to think of it. He was a right-handed man, was he not? I mean, to stab himself in the left shoulder, he must have been. I was always so sorry for poor Jack Baines in the war. He shot himself in the foot, you remember, after very severe fighting at Arras. He told me about it when I went to see him in hospital, and very ashamed of it he was. I don't expect this poor man, Elliot Hayden, profited much by his wicked crime. Elliot Hayden? cried Raymond. You think he did it? I don't see how anyone else could have done it, said Miss Marple opening her eyes in gentle surprise. I mean, if, as Mr. Petherick so wisely says, one looks at the facts and disregards all that atmosphere of heathen goddesses, which I don't think is very nice, he went up to him first and turned him over. And of course, to do that, he would have to have had his back to them all. 
and being dressed as a brigand chief, he would be sure to have a weapon of some kind in his belt. I remember dancing with a man dressed as a brigand chief when I was a young girl. He had five kinds of knives and daggers, and I can't tell you how awkward and uncomfortable it was for his partner. All eyes were turned towards Dr. Pender. I knew the truth, said he, five years after that tragedy occurred. It came in the shape of a letter written to me by Elliot Hayden. He said in it that he fancied that I had always suspected him. He said it was a sudden temptation. He too loved Diana Ashley, but he was only a poor struggling barrister. With Richard out of the way and inheriting his title and estates, he saw a wonderful prospect opening up before him. The dagger had jerked out of his belt as he knelt down by his cousin, and almost before he had time to think, he drove it in and returned it to his belt again. He stabbed himself later in order to divert suspicion. He wrote to me on the eve of starting on an expedition to the South Pole, in case, as he said, he should never come back. I do not think that he meant to come back. And I know that, as Miss Marple has said, his crime profited him nothing. For five years, he wrote, I have lived in hell. I hope, at least, that I may expiate my crime by dying honorably. There was a pause. And he did die honorably, said Sir Henry. You have changed the names in your story, Dr. Pender, but I think I recognize the man you mean. As I said, went on the old clergyman, I do not think that explanation quite covers the fact. I still think there was an evil influence in that grove, an influence that directed Elliot Hayden's action. Even to this day, I can never think without a shudder of the idol house of Astarte. <laughs>